The very best founders that I work with, the most talented, most capable, most sought after, are also the ones where, you know, we have the highest bandwidth engagement. You need to have just some glaring deficiency in the, in the current in the current approaches. And so you almost need to find, you know, founders that are like just pissed off. Peter, this is such a joy to do. I've heard so many great things from many different members on your team and founders that you've worked with. So thank you so much for joining me today. Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm a, I'm a big fan of your work, big fan of the show. So it's, uh, it's great to be here. That's very, very kind of you. I would love to start with a little bit of scene setting, though. Uh, you joined Venture um, a, a while ago <laughs> in July 96. Um, how did you get the job at Excel? Can you just take me to that and how you got into Venture there? It was kind of an accident. I was trying to get a job in a startup and I inadvertently became a venture capitalist. Um, but I, I was a product manager at a company called Silicon Graphics, which was a high flyer in the early 90s. We were doing 3D graphics and digital media. And uh, I'd been there about four years. <clears throat> and it, you know, the reason I'd gone there was to try and get the base of experience that could make me you know, somewhat valuable <laughs> in a startup. So I was starting to talk to some startup opportunities. And Got to know a few of the venture backers in the course of that, and it turned out that none of those startups were quite right for me, but uh, some of the venture people said, you know, hey, maybe, maybe you might want to come and, and work with us for a while. And I, I thought that might be a decent uh, position to, you know, identify a better startup opportunity. So uh, so I ended up joining Excel. Um, I took a pay cut <laughs> to do it, uh, and I thought of it as like, and, and I wasn't making a lot of money at SGI, so that, that kind of tells you how how the industry worked then. But um, I thought I might be there for like eighteen months, and you know, it's been a little longer than that. <laughs> at what point did you realize it was what you wanted to do? Pretty quickly, actually. I was pretty lucky too, Harry. Like if you remember, you know, those days, you know, joining in '96 and and working in the late '90s. I mean, the internet boom was on. You know, the Netscape IPO had happened, uh, and uh, a lot of things you know were happening that no one had really seen before. And so it was it was really fertile ground. It was really fun. Um, you know, I got very lucky with you know a number of my early investments. How important do you think it is to have hits early on in your investing career? You know, it's a double-edged sword, right? So it, it can be very good in terms of building uh, some credibility and some reputation. And that certainly was the case, you know, for me. And so it, it brought, you know, maybe sort of more relevant and interesting to to founders. On the other hand, you know, maybe I skipped over some of the important lessons <laughs> that one needs to learn early in one's career. And and uh, of course, it, you know, it's not that those lessons weren't there. I just ended up learning them in, you know, the the post to dot com bust uh, downturn when you know all the cracks were revealed, <laughs> and uh, it might have been might have been better to to have uh, some experience with some of those things up front. But you know, you you play the cards you dealt. Can I ask you one, which is like, you know, you've seen so many different macro environments that mentioning kind of obviously the years before the dot com. You know, I looked at this last few years and the craziness and I was like, I get it for younger people. This is kind of all we've experienced. But when I look at some of the large firms that we saw deploying such crazy amounts at such crazy prices, and I looked at their partners and I was like, you shouldn't have done this. You've seen this before. Like, you know how this game works. How do you think about actually every situation being fresh or actually learning from the past? I'm just intrigued, given the many different exposures from macro, how it happened again. You want to learn from the past, but you don't want to overlearn from the past. I think what, one of the behaviors in venture, you know, which you just you know noted, is that uh, you know there's this kind of safety in the herd thing. And, and a, a belief uh, within, you know, firms and, and partners and not incorrect that if they're making the same mistake that everyone else in the industry is making, they probably won't be punished for it because, you know, the capital has to go somewhere. And, uh, you know, so the real dangerous thing is to make the unusual mistake that no one else made. <laughs> uh, and so, you know, this is um, it's one of the things that kind of drags down returns in the industry. It's one of the things that makes it a very cyclical business. Uh, it's, uh, you know, and it's it's just a behavior that's been there kind of forever you know because you know the flip side of um of sort of sort of maintaining discipline is sometimes um you know missing out on a on a huge um sort of acceleration and i certainly saw that when in the like back to the late 90s you know there were people uh good venture capitalists that were like you know what 
you know, these valuations are just too high. I'm not investing in these internet companies. You know, it just doesn't make sense. And, you know, they kind of missed out on a pretty transformative phase. So, you know, there's this ba- this horse race between fear and greed, as, uh, as an old professor of mine used to say, and uh, it, it continues no, to play so how out. Do you, how do you think about that today with AI? I'm just too intrigued. I, I know we had a schedule and I'm just like freewheeling here. But like we had Roger Ehrenberg on the show the other day and he's like, you know what? If I was still investing, there's no way I'd be doing pure AI. It's just too frothy. But then you also have to understand that it could be the next super cycle, in which case you can't miss it. How do we balance yeah. that in your mind? Yeah. Well, I mean, I think it is the next super cycle, so so you can't miss it. But then the, the question is, okay, how to participate? And so just, you know, there's lots of ways uh, to invest in that, tra- you know, that AI first transformation of business. It, where we haven't been investing is the super capital intensive, uh, very, very high priced, uh, you know, sort of LLM development shops or, uh, or other, you know, uh, other sorts of similar projects. And it's not to say that those aren't important technologies and companies, and it's not to say that people won't make money there, but it's just not the strategy that we've chosen. How do you think of the founders fund? Oh, fuck it. We can't predict. Let's just plow into open AI. You know, so the sort of back up the truck on, on, on your winners thing is, um, I think it, it, that's a strategy that works, I think, for an asset gatherer. You know, so there's mm-hmm. sort of two business models in venture. You know, you can be in the assets under management game, or you can be in the re- the generate best possible returns game. Uh, and you know, if I'm an asset gatherer, I need places to put assets that deliver quote good enough returns. You know, if I'm a return generator, you know, then I, I'm I'm actually looking to really maximize multiple uninvested capital, and I'm not. Um, just sort of deploying at scale. Anytime you meet an investor that talks about the amount of capital they deploy per year, right? You know you're talking to, you know, an asset gatherer. And so, you know, we, this comes up for us a lot. I mean, you know, when, we, you know, our in our best companies, you know, they they may be doing large, high price, later stage rounds. How do we participate as you know one of the initiating investors, one of the really early investors? Is it you know are these things on model or off model for us and you know, generally we we don't attempt to um, drag down uh, the returns or, or or get too far off strategy by playing super heavy in, in those types of financings, and and would prefer to you know preserve the capital for you know that next early stage company. There's so many things for me to unpack here. Uh, do you think that actually boutique providers can play in a world of asset accumulators, though, in the way that we see Andreessen move so fast and so aggressively down, as we have seen, I know, over years for large players. But they really do. And the prices are so freaking high. I'm a seed player. I'm a, you know, a returns driven investor too. They ruin a lot of rounds because the prices that they pay and the capital they put to work in pre-seed, pre-product companies. Can boutiques and asset accumulators play together? Yeah, it's it's a great question, Harry, right? Um, I mean, it's like one of the existential questions. And, uh, you know, I've, I've, it's. I think they can, uh, and and we do it all the time. And you know, there there is there is a risk here. Uh, and so there's certainly lots of otherwise good opportunities that have been polluted or dragged down uh, by you know whatever soft bank showing up and and uh, you know or, or, or any other number of people that, that we can that we can name. But it, but it just means like if you're the focused player, if you're you know in our case the early stage investor and the long term company builder, you, you know you've got to find that that model that's sort of harmonious to. You know what I sort of like sometimes call the aircraft carriers, which are these kind of multi-product line, multi-geography, multi-strategy capital deployment, you know, operations. Uh, and you know, so how do you leverage that force to your benefit and not not be run over by it? And so I think you know, in our case, um, many of the the sort of very scaled up capital deployers, you know, they sort of recognize the quality of the early stage work that, that we're doing. And I mean, and in many ways, uh, you know, a company where Wing has been very hands-on and working with the founders to build the foundation the right way, that's a very attractive place uh, to uh, to invest if you're someone with a lot of capital under management. So, And it's like, can you honestly advise founders that if they have a 10 on 50 from an aircraft carrier, that they should take your 3 on 15 instead? Well, I don't know. Sometimes I might not advise that and i might just say okay we're gonna, we're gonna do the 10 on 52 you know you know because in in some cases that that might that might be the answer but you sort of have to be you have to be selective you mentioned there about you know multi-stage players appreciating that the craftsmanship of seed may be in the value that one brings at seed putting it out there i don't think the best founders 
need help from VCs. Um, founders Fund would agree with me, or I agree with them, whichever one we want to take. Um, do the best founders need their VCs? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, but, you know, they might not, you know, the, the, it doesn't mean that they can't accomplish great things on their own, but they can accomplish more greater things with, with a good business partner. I think it depends on the investor to, you know, to, frankly, to, to a large degree. Um, it also depends on the founder. The very best founders that I work with, uh, the most talented, most capable, most sought after, are also the ones where you know we have the highest bandwidth engagement. Um, sort of, I think, get to the the root of issues and come up with better answers together. You know, most frequently. And so, you know, I think there is a high correlation, you know, between the the caliber of the founder and also their ability to get the most out of. Uh, out of the relationships they have with their investors and, and, and their board members. You mentioned you know, working with some of the best. Some of those uh, entrepreneurs that you worked with were during your time with Excel, you know, close to, I think, 15 years, 14 years and whatever months it was. I'd just love to unpack some lessons from that because it went from a bluntly smaller firm um, in you know, singular locations to a global player and an aircraft carrier in many respects. My question to you is, what are one or two of the big lessons that you took from your time in Excel, having been there so early and seeing so much? Yeah. So, well, so when I joined Excel, I mean, we were, we were very focused um, thematically. I was also a pretty small team. I mean, there were the founders, Jim Swartz and Arthur Patterson. Jim Breyer was there. Um, you know, there was a healthcare team that would soon be spun off. It was like one other associate that had gotten there a year ahead of me. And I mean, and that was it, <laughs> you know, but the team, the, the firm had very big ambitions and, and was not willing to sort of place itself second, second to anyone. And, and so certainly aspired to the, to the top ranks of the industry. And I think that ambition ended up being, uh, you know, a pretty important ingredient, uh, you know, in terms of the, the things that the firm did really well that, that have allowed it to be as successful as it is today. Um, you know, one was, um, developing next generation venture capital investors. The firm for, you know, combination of reasons we can talk about was just exceptional at identifying um, superb talent and then developing it uh, within, you know, within the firm. Uh, and if you, if you look back, I mean, there's just a very long list of people both still in the firm and also people, you know, alumni that have left uh, that have really made an impact on the industry have led, you know, really important uh, high performing firms or, or, or founded their own. Um, and I think it's it's a it's quite an unusual track record in terms of talent development, and we've you know we've sort of attempted to apply that you know here within Wing as well. What do they do to develop talent so well? Do you think what specifically about Excel makes them good at talent development? Yeah, I mean I think it's this um, interesting combination of giving, um, well you bring the right raw material in first, okay, <laughs> and then and then you give that person. Um, both enough rope to hang themselves so that they're, you know, feeling tremendous accountability, you know, what uh, will be called the sleepless night factor, uh, but also guardrails uh, that protect them from making, you know, really egregious, uh, you know, blunders, right? And so this combination of guardrails and enough rope to hang yourself is sort of the magic of it. And it, and it, it accelerates learning tremendously. And, and it's done in sort of a non-hierarchical fashion too. So we were aspiring to the flat partnership, which means even, you know, the most junior people, the brand new associate like me, you know, sort of had an equal voice. And, you know, even though, okay, yeah, there, <laughs> there, there was people with a lot more experience, but you sort of felt like, you know, you were, uh, you know, you were a peer, even if, even if mainly some of that was optical and you, and you were forced to behave like that and, and approach decision-making in that manner. So, you know, so you weren't carrying someone's bag for three years or, you know, be doing support work. Uh, you know, you were sort of on the stage, but you also had a lot of backup. So I think that th those are some of the key ingredients. What's the sleepless night factor? Sorry, I haven't heard this before. Yeah, well, the sleep. Well, this is where you're sweating some investment, either a decision you're about to make about a new investment, or uh, you know some problem at an existing portfolio company, and you feel such intense personal accountability that you're literally losing sleep over it. And and to this day, <laughs> I lose sleep over this stuff. Um, and that, you know, in, in many ways brings out, you know, the essence of the business. Uh, you know, like, like we, we live, especially in early stage, we live in a world filled with uncertainty um, and, you know, trying to trying to peer through it and make consequential decisions about capital and people and uh, stuff that matters. But doing this, 
you know, in uh, in this zone of uncertainty is a really, really difficult thing to do. And so you kind of you have to sweat it, you know, <laughs> in order to in order to uh, in order to get good at it. Now, that, so that kind of individual accountability is super important, but group responsibility and support is also, you know, very important too. So, uh, and so kind of the, the tension between, you know, individual accountability and group responsibility, getting that right, uh, I think is, um, is part of the magic. Talking of sweating it, what did Excel not do that with the benefit of hindsight you would have done or would have done differently? Well, you know, I mean, really starting in like 2000, we um, began to uh, extend the product line, if you will. Uh, and so we went from doing, you know, kind of early stage investing almost exclusively on, in B2B and actually specifically called out enterprise software and communications, right? That was the go the strategy that, that we saw in 96. And in 2000, you know, we launched Excel London. Uh, and Kevin Camoli came on, and he did a tremendous job uh, in in building that uh, in building that team, and made it into you know a, a leader, which you're very familiar with, and um, and that was really just the beginning. <laughs> and you know what came later, of course, were other geographic extensions in China and India, stage extensions with the launch of the growth funds, uh, which you know, of course, have been have been incredibly successful sector expansions. You know, we developed a, a, a big uh, consumer practice, you know, which hadn't really been there before. Uh, and 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 so what I think uh, amidst all the success of that, I think what we underestimated uh, sort of the impact of scale and complexity. And, you know, and so we had, we had sort of built the firm around focus. Now we were intentionally moving away from you know, that kind of single threaded strategy and what would the consequences be? And it, it turned out at least, you know, in my opinion, um, that it's difficult to have all these different strategies cohabitate uh, in, uh, under one roof. They have different methodologies. You have to build the teams differently. Um, you know, the investment decisions are made, you know, with, with, with very different um, criteria. And it's, it's not a layup um, getting that right. And, and this is why you know, I think early stage firms that just sort of add an opportunity fund, I think, are maybe getting into some, you know, some things that they maybe don't fully understand because, you know, nothing, nothing comes for free. You know, if you're going to, if you're going to do later stage investing, growth stage investing, even in your own companies, you got to think about it like a growth investor. You've got to, you know, develop those people, that mindset, those skills. And, uh, you know, we've chosen not to do it here at Wing, you know, because, we, you know, we're sort of more on the, the, the side of focus in terms of how we think we're going to compete. Um, and, um, yeah, so I think, you know, that ended up being kind of a big deal. So would you have not done it? I don't think so because, I mean, because it's hard to argue, you know, uh, with, uh, with the success that the firm has had. So I think that was a, if that's what you want to do, right. You know, then, you know, there's a strategy there, but you know, every strategies are involve choices, you know? And so, okay, if you're, if you're going to go that road, you know, there are benefits and there are consequences. You've mentioned the specialization within Wing and, you know, the sector expertise that you've built both in the team and over time. I think it leads me to a question that I often struggle with, which is, you know, pattern recognition, often uh, valid and important in identifying amazing companies and founders, sometimes important to disregard. How do you see pattern recognition as a benefit or as a drawback? when investing today? Pattern recognition is a very useful tool and it's, an, you know, it's important, but you can't be a prisoner of it. The anomaly is the pattern sometimes, you know, like you're, you're looking for the special company, you know, a, a lot of times the pattern you're looking for is, uh, is the pattern that can allow that specialness uh, uh, to express. So, so it's, um, I guess there's a question of which pattern. <laughs> Uh, you know, one one might be looking for. If we were to dig on the anomaly as the pattern, what would be some examples of that, and what is that pattern that we find in B two B technology, uh, which is where we focus? Deep understanding of the, of, of what you're uh, on the part of the founders uh, of, of what they're attempting to to disrupt is actually really important. But you need to have also, you know, that that deep understanding, which is really informed by just some glaring deficiency in the, in the current in the current approaches and so you almost need to find uh, you know founders that are like just pissed off uh, about you know the way that, you know they've been forced to do something or their companies were pursuing something and it, and they almost just like can't look away it's become like this personal animating factor 
Um, it, it's not all that often that you know you have a, a total outsider show up in a sector and it's like I'm gonna I'm gonna completely change this within B two B. I mean, I think in you know some of the consumer sectors, I can think of some pretty good examples. But like the best entrepreneurs that I've worked with, you know, they had really you know they, they were world's experts. Uh, but they also had that that personal motivation. Like if I think of the Snowflake guys, you know, uh, you know Benoit and Terry, the two principal founders, they had worked in the belly of the beast for like decades uh, over at Oracle. Um, you know, sort of kept under lock and key, you know, in the in the in the in the, in the architecture groups, uh, and they just kind of got fed up with how they were being forced to do things, and they saw the power of the cloud, and they realized they were not going to be able to execute on what they thought was possible within Oracle. So they're just like, you know what? Maybe this will fail completely, but we're out of here <laughs> and we're, we're going to take a run at it. And, and I think that's just, that's just a fabulous, that's a fabulous archetype. You know, so when I met those guys in the, in the course of our, our seed investment in Snowflake, you know, that was one of the things that really, really got me excited about working with them. And remember, these are like middle-aged French guys, right? You know, they, they were not out of central casting uh, for sort of fashionable founders. And, and, and they talk about that, you know, themselves, like who would bet on us? Okay, so we, we prefer insiders to a product over the outsider mindset. Can I ask, we, we, on the product side and on the market side, we have market creation or like new category creation, or we have optimization, innovating, but in a well-known product category in an existing market, making something better, not new necessarily. Um, how do you think about a preference when it comes to market creation versus kind of product innovation and product improvement? Yeah, well, I mean, I've done both. Uh, you know, and have had both work pretty well. I think, I think there's, there's a sweet spot in there, Harry, you know, um, you know, cause certainly category creation is difficult. It can take a long time and, and you can time it wrong. <laughs> you know, there's, you know, many, many times people have attempted to create a categories and they were right, but early, you know, which amounted to being wrong. Um, and, and so, you know, finding, um, that opportunity, which is close enough to something that people understand, so it isn't just a complete lobotomy for the customer, right? You know, so that so they have some grounding, but different enough so that it isn't just kind of an obvious next move by all the incumbents. You know, that's that's kind of a sweet spot. Um, again, so maybe Snowflake's an example of that, right? People knew data warehousing, but you know, the whole idea of doing this, uh, leveraging the power of the cloud was a really important transformational thing. So, you know, so we had these 20 million people <laughs> that were trained on SQL and the whole tool ecosystem that we could take advantage of. Uh, but uh, we also had, you know, an architecture and a set of capabilities that were going to unlock value that was going to be really hard for a Teradata or an Oracle uh, to do. So, you know, so that's a good example of it's like, well, is that category creation or is that you know, working in existing category. I mean, it, it's kind of both. I mean, I would contrast that with um, another cloud data company that I worked very closely with called Pinecone, you know, where I led that seed investment back in 2020. You know, Pinecone in some ways is the snowflake of AI and they're the champions of, of you know, vector data and, you know, all the, all the different capabilities I need to manage and, and take advantage of the vector representation of data, which happens to be the native language of, of AI. But when we were doing this, like when I first met Edo Liberty in 2019, the founder, I mean, nobody was talking about that. Nobody, you know, nobody was, <laughs> there was no, <laughs> there was no chat GPT, uh, you know, LLMs were not on everyone's lips. And, and so that's a more kind of evangelical category creation mission you know, for this first several years, the company existed, uh, you know, it was kind of, you know, it was, it was very much an educational, uh, you know, a uh, set of interactions with, with the customers, which, you know, we were prepared to take on. How do you think about market timing risk? It's something that I don't like to take, as you said, being, you know, wrong on timing is, is crucial. And you can yeah. be right in your theory and wrong on timing and, you know, dos butter, no parsnips, as we say in the UK. And so... How do you think about market timing risk? Well, I mean, I guess you could say sometimes you have to get lucky. It's one of the risks that we talk about the most uh, as early stage investors. Um, and, you know, again, I think the, the thematic focus and sort of only working in domains that you understand really well is an advantage. Uh, you know, you have, um, I think, better better proximity to judge when, you know, when the architectural transition uh, is 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 likely to occur. You have a lot of customer intimacy, so you can sort of sense the the level of urgency or or the amount of frustration uh, with existing approaches. Um, 
And uh, but it's it's still easy to get wrong. I mean, I you know I, I get it wrong all the time. Well, with that, how do you think about like market sizing? Because you have so many investors that say, you know, we just need massive markets. You have others that say, hey, we like niche insertion points that can expand. Uh, do you think we can accurately predict market sizing? How do you approach it when you evaluate new opportunities today? We always want the very tightly defined entry value proposition, right? So it's you know the ICP is clear. The pain that you're addressing is clear. The value proposition is clear, um, but that needs to lead to a very large market, right? Uh, and so, how do I have the tightly defined wedge, but also the large addressable market? It's incredibly difficult for a startup to do a second thing, you know. So, so any any sort of notion about oh well, I'll do this first thing, and it's not that big an opportunity, but I'll be then I'll be able to do this second thing. It's like oh boy, you know, like it's hard enough to do one thing. <laughs> No, I, had, I had an LP meeting the other day and they said, what do you not do? And I said, multi-layered dependencies, which is exactly this. You see it often in fintech where people say, and then if we layer on refinancing or mortgages, and it's like, it sounds like a very casual we layer on. That is not an easy thing to do. And I don't want to bet the farm on a second act. Yeah, totally, totally. And and so so, the, so that large market needs to be there and the contain wedge into it needs to be there. And then, and we'll pass on a lot of <laughs> If they're missing, if they're missing one or the other, uh, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm sort of still, I'm still recovering, you know, from a recent mistake where market size bit us, you know, and or bit me, and and was, you know, we were betting on the on the development of a new market, and it just kind of beca- became clear that it was never going to become important to any, <laughs> to the to the broader population of companies. It was sort of a small set that really cared, and then outside of that. Not so much. Right, on that reflection, I, I'm so sorry to ask if it's if it's painful, but I think often from the hard things you learn the most. And if you reflect on that, what did you learn? What did you not see? What 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 are your reflections? So it's, it was a trust and safety product, and it was going to use AI to uh, to support the trust and safety efforts uh, of you know on you know businesses and brands online. This was thought like, okay, well, this is going to be an enhancement to. Uh, customer experience, you know, it was starting out, it was like super important in verticals like gaming and dating, you know, but this was going to end up mattering to everybody that was doing business online, right? That, that, that was the premise. Turned out not some, not <laughs> actually, no, uh, you know, the, the willingness to spend was really actually concentrated and at, at least now uh, in a, in a relatively small number of businesses. And I, I think the mistake was like, I really wanted it to be true. Like, and and maybe, you know, because I would just love for the internet to be that kind of place, <laughs> you know, with sort of better behaviors being reinforced and, you know, kind of bad behaviors being reduced. Like, like I don't know if you can see this poster behind me here, Harry. It says, I want to believe, you know. Yeah. <laughs> that's, I wanted to believe uh, so much that I maybe I uh, allowed myself to um, sort of over overlook overlook some gaps um and how do you, you know, prevent getting how do you prevent getting cynical over time peter and i don't mean that rudely but you've seen so much and often i speak to many investors who have been in the business for you know multiple decades and they're cynical because they've seen so many failures and they've seen so many different things how do you not be cynical in these cases you know i, I just i think the founders keep me from being cynical <laughs> uh you know because they're so you know fun to work with um they look at things you know, so differently. And, and so just, you know, hanging out with founders all the time, which is kind of what I do, um, I, th- I think sort of is, is a pretty good antidote <laughs> to, to cynicism, at, at least for me it is. I, I never like companies that are a net new line item for someone. And I think in the case of that, from the sounds of it, it was a net new line item for a buyer. How do you think about companies when it is a net new line item for a buyer and you're not replacing something but you're really adding an additional cost. Yeah, well, you better have line of sight on where that budget's going to come from and who owns it. You know, net net new is not usually ever really net new. <laughs> I mean, it might it might be a, a new line item, but you know, hopefully you are, uh, you know, funding is available from things maybe that the customer no longer needs uh, or sufficient gains that are going to pay for it. And that can take a little. I mean, that's part of the friction, right? You know, when when you're proposing something new, is it ta- it takes a little while for that to sort out. Um, you know, my, uh, my another company I work with uh, is uh, Gong, right? Uh, pretty uh, pretty successful sales technology company, and you know what Gong brought to market that was a net new thing. 
uh, and, uh, and, and it did constitute, you know, additional spend, but, you know, the gain from it was so clear and so obvious and, 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 uh, and the pull, you know, once, once users got their hands on it was so strong that, you know, with other budget was able to be able to be reallocated, uh, you know, to fund, to fund that investment and it, and it became kind of a must have, in the sales tool belt. So I mean, I love projects like that. I mean, I'd rather have been doing that in sales tech than, oh, here's a better CRM, you know, unplug Salesforce and plug in my CRM. You know, like to me, that's a fool's errand. You know, that's that's not happening. You, know, you mentioned Gong, you mentioned Pinecone, you mentioned Snowflake. I, th- I think we also learn from uh, mistakes that we make investing wise. I'm just intrigued on like your biggest size wise. What was your biggest size wise and how did that change your mindset? <laughs> you know, I'm Harry, like my, my biggest miss is also one of my biggest wins. Um, so, <laughs> so, so like, you know, we, we were seed investors in Snowflake and then, you know, in series A investors and we were, you know, positioning uh, ourselves to lead this series B <laughs> and had, you know, sort of a lot of conversations. And I think, you know, a, a lot of agreement with the founders around a $10 million series B wing one, that was a good size for wing one, you know, which is a very pretty small fund. And then, you know, but we, we underestimated how rapidly the venture market was moving in terms of the size of financings and that, you know, $10 million financing suddenly wanted to be a 20. And, you know, the lead check went from six to 12 and we felt like we couldn't do that, you know, within little wing one. So we passed. What a dumb move. Biggest, (laughs) you know, in retrospect, right? You know, this is our company that we were already working in and, and and because of the size of the financing, we still love the company, right? You know, but because literally because of the size of the financing relative to the size of our fund, you know, we we didn't step forward, uh, you know, into that. And it's I think, you know, as an opportunity cost, obviously it's not a, a loss in, in in sense of lost capital, but as an opportunity cost, probably the biggest biggest opportunity cost <laughs> I've ever been involved in. And uh, yeah, you know, so that's that's back to this thing we were talking about earlier about being the, you know, the the focused player in. In, in a in a scaling industry with you know large pools of capital sloshing around and I mean this this definitely informed <laughs> informed my point of view of it. Why not do it? Why not just resize? Because I understand in terms of proportion of capital, you have to be cognizant of percent of fund size and how concentrated you are. But why not just resize, given your existing knowledge of the company? Resize what? Like the fund? No, resize the check. You know, I, you said it went from like six to twelve. I'm saying, why not invest just three or six? Why do nothing? Oh, well, we like, didn't really have that opportunity, you know, because there oh, was you had to do twelve. Yeah, no, there was there was a, an opportunity for a lead investor, and then the existing investors, you know, were not backing off their pro rata. So was, you're either going to do twelve or just play your pro rata. I mean, you know, with that's which is what we ended up doing. Um, but, you know, obviously in retrospect, I wish we'd invested the 12 and, you know, the firm that did invest the 12, I think it's like the best investment in their history. You know, the series B itself. <laughs> and, so, and so that's, that was a big lesson learned. That one though I get, to be fair on you, you're right. Like when you look back with rationale, 10% of the fund would be highly concentrated in the early life of a fund. It's understandable, really still painful uh but you know it's okay i mean we can laugh about it because obviously it's you know it was it was a great company i think in terms of like actual losses you know like like okay sure it's fun to talk about you know a success and pretend it's a loss but like in terms of actual losses um <laughs> here's I, ju- uh, I just work too hard peter that's my weakness <laughs> yeah yeah my standards are too high <laughs> one of my very first deals like in my first year in the business um you know, I, I I was spending a lot of time on the broadband uh, build out and you know networking technology, and I invested in like this uh, competitive local exchange carrier, a CLEC, that was going to build out a national DSL network because you know it just wasn't happening fast enough, and there was so much demand for it. And this ended up being a huge win. The company went public; it was worth you know quite a few billion dollars, and. And I was like, wow, that was, that's great. Let's do some more of those. And what I didn't really realize was sort of like it was an unnatural moment in time that companies like that could be built on venture capital. Uh, you know, like we were doing high yield debt offerings, you know, out of a startup, you know, to, to build out, you know, this broadband network. And, and, uh, and that, you know, to quote one of, one of my favorite co-investors, that works until it doesn't. 
And, you know, so, you know, I went and invested in like two or three other of these next generation uh, communication service providers that were ledged, you know, deploying broadband and voice over IP and all these cool new technologies, optical networks. And, uh, and we were doing high yield offerings and, you know, and then, and then 9-11 happened, access to capital, you know, kind of went to zero for those sorts of things. And, you know, and, and it, and the, there were some big losses that, that piled up there. I, I had one company where we had invested pretty substantially. I had Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley co-leading the IPO, which they never did even then. You know, so they were signed up as co-managing, um, you know, underwriters. Nine months later, company was out of business. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it, it's just that's how fast access to capital flipped. And, and for a business like that, if you don't have access to capital, you, you know, you don't have a business. So is there a lesson or takeaway from that then? Well, yeah, there is, which is like some, you know, some businesses are might be good businesses, but really aren't venture appropriate. Uh, and, uh, and so I, I think that's kind of what I took away from this. There's a lot, you know, there was lots of, um, opportunity to build, you know, big, um, network operations type companies and, you know, look at the build out of the cellular industry, for example, or, you know, the, uh, and, but there's also a capital intensity, uh, and a sort of financial engineering, um, elements to that, that make it very, uh, very difficult to think you're going to do that uh, out of venture capital, which is really built more around a lot of IP, a lot of team tenacity and unique perception and, you know, more, more moderate amounts of capital. And so I, you know, I applied that lesson in other sectors later, you know, steering clear of, you know, certain super capital intensive clean tech projects. This is my question though, which is now you have defense and military, you've got climate, you've got battery and energy, you've got a lot of like very real physical heavy capital intensive categories that venture investors are plowing into like never before or maybe you'll say it, it you know history rhymes but are they making the same mistake do you think yes <laughs> yeah, that's it. and and uh, you know and you can get away with it sometimes just like i got away with it with that early deal if you can find you know other people's money uh, on advantageous terms to sort of fund you through, uh, you know, the valley of death there. Uh, you know, like, I mean, there's famous, you know, big, important companies like Tesla, you know, that wouldn't be what they are today if there were, if, you know, if there wasn't sort of certain miracle financings that occurred at just, at just the right time, you know? And, uh, and so then people, you know, see those, um, sort of hero experiments and they think, well, let's do another one of those. Uh, maybe, not appreciating the singularity of you know the, the the unique circumstances that that actually allowed some of those situations to prosper i think the nuance of every situation is often forgotten and then we try and extrapolate so many commonalities but there are so many intricate little things that lead to certain events happening and um I, I completely agree with you. You spoke earlier about kind of being a, a, a prisoner in some mental confines. Um, I think it was talking about kind of market sizing and, and then also um, pattern recognition. You know, I had Peter Fenton on the show, uh, yeah, who I guess you worked with at Excel, did you, for a period? Yeah, Peter, yeah. Peter and I were partners for six or seven years. I, I have tremendous respect for Peter. Um, you know, the day he... The day he told me he was uh, leaving us and, and going to benchmark was uh, one of the most discouraging days of my career. <laughs> I really, uh, really missed working with him. Yeah, uh, I think he's just exceptional. But he, he said on the show, price is a mental trap. I'm intrigued from your many years investing. How do you reflect on your own sensitivity in relationship to price and when to pay up versus when not to? I think Peter's talking about that you know, through the lens of, of, of an early stage investing. Um, cause certainly if, if you were talking to a growth investor, they would not say that, <laughs> you know, like, like price matters <laughs> a lot <laughs> when you're doing growth stage investing and ask any of the people that were piling, you know, large sums into, into companies in, in 2021 and, and early 22, how they, how they feel about price right now. And, and, you know, so pr price really matters in, but, but in, the, in those stages, but it's in early stage, right. It is, is uh, there are some ways you can be over, overly obsessed with price. And it's not to say that it doesn't matter, but I mean, I'll give you two examples or two ways that I think about it. Like one, and this is kind of obvious, like a low price is never a reason to do, to make an investment. 
um, right? So there's no 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 price, uh, you know, that that will that is sufficient justification for for something that is you know otherwise flawed. Uh, so that I mean, I mean, I think some people call that a value trap. Then what about the flip side, though? And and what I th- what I found um, is when I'm getting really nervous about a price getting too high. Um, often, actually, what what that also is, it's an indication that maybe my conviction is lacking. I don't I don't have sufficient conviction around this investment, and so queasiness about price is actually a symptom that my conviction is is thin, and that's like. You know, for me anyway, that's an important voice to listen to, because you know, uh, it's uh, it, it it may not. I might not actually be. You know, price may not be the you know the main thing that I'm worried about, but it's but it's revealing this other thing. Uh, you know that that I need to pay attention to. So I had a conversation with one of my partners today, and they said that you need to be more open minded, Harry. I said, why? <laughs> you're fired um <laughs> uh, but i said why and they said because i i bring a five on 25 to you and you're just like nope you don't care you don't care and i'm like yeah i i five on 25 and we need to make a decision by the end of the week is not a deal that i ever want to do well the, Am the I second wrong? part I, the second part i totally agree with <laughs> you know which is make make it you know no no ability to actually you know, really understand what you're getting into that. That's a no fly zone. I agree. <laughs> so, so I totally agree. I will, of course, do a five on 25. If there is the ability to build the relationship, there's an existing relationship, many different things, but the time compressed, Hey, and it's got to be very quick. You're with me, right? Like I'm not being unreasonable. I'm actually asking your advice here. No, no, I, I totally agree. And we, you know, we pass on things because of time compression all the time. How much do you regret it? Less frequently than you might think. <laughs> you know, um, so, the, like, if I if I just try and think of the times where it's like, oh boy, yeah, we saw that deal, but we had no time to make a decision, so we passed, and it ended up being intergalactic. It doesn't come up that much. Um, there's plenty of things we don't see and there's stuff that's outside of our, you know, scope that, you know, we just don't, you know, don't work on at all. But, um, you know, the, the whole, the stampeded, uh, process, I think, you know, I, don't, I just don't think the best companies <laughs> are built that way. You know, I mean, founders need to take their time too <laughs> in understanding, you know, who they're getting in business with. This is, this is a long-term <laughs> life decision. And I, I think the best founders do that. Like, like when I met, I met Ido Liberty, uh, you know, the founder of Pinecone in 2019. He hadn't, uh, he hadn't left uh, AWS yet. It was like early 2019. I, we didn't, I ended up leading that seed financing in the fall of 2020. Like that's how long that went on. Uh, and, uh, and, and that was, and that was necessary, you know, both maybe I'm dense and took me a while to get it. Uh, but also, you know, Ido uh, was also very, you know, very persistent and I just, you know, came to know what he was all about and, and, and develop such uh, sort of high regard for, for him and what he was doing. But it, you know, it took some time, um, you know, to get there. And, and in the end, you know, you might say, oh boy, Peter, you overpaid for that seed project. Like we, you know, we invested uh, $7 million at 35 post, right? Like, oh, 35 post for a company with like no revenue and no customers and blah, blah, blah. No, that's what we did. But, <clears throat> you know, I had conviction at that point <laughs> around some important things. And I think in, in retrospect, you know, we're glad we did it. And, you know, is that is that a Fentonian case where, you know, we avoided the, the mental trap of price? Maybe. maybe. What was Pinecone's latest price? Yeah, it's, you know, it's measured in the billions. There you go. That works. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <'cause laughs> price, price, price is one thing. People often think price and ownership are one. They're not. Like, ownership is, is very different still. How do you think about ownership and the right levels? I, I you know, I, I tweeted something this morning and then, you know, a founder, Dan Soroka, came back and said, oh, I never let a round be over 10% dilution. And I said, well, that's, that's very challenging because you've just excluded a bunch of great investors from ever investing in your company because... The max I gets eight with two from existings. So it's a challenge. Um, how do you think about ownership and what's enough for you? Yeah, this is a great question, Harry. You know, so when I when I got into the into the business, you know, there was the twenty percent rule, like, oh, we need yeah. to own twenty percent. <laughs> you know? And, I, and I remember days, thinking <laughs> like in one of my early partner meetings, you know, I heard that and I'm like, why? Like what you know, what where'd that come from? Why twenty? You know, what is why not? 
well, you know, that's a number. Okay. What, what about some other numbers? Aren't we just sort of, isn't it about like how much gain you make and the return on capital and, you know, all this. And, and I think it was just sort of an artifact of, you know, size of outcomes and size of funds at a certain moment in time. Right. And so kind of, and, and I think, you know, 20% ownership, you know, with some dilution later on, you know, what constituted a good outcome at the time would sort of return a fund or maybe, you know, twice return a fund. And, and you know, and so the math sort of hung together. It was the relationship between all those things. All those things have obviously changed now, right? Fund sizes are different. Outcome sizes are different. You know, so there's no, no real reason the 20% rule should make any sense. But I think that the logic that especially if you're devoting real time to a project, which is what we do, right, as an early stage lead investor, and not just time in the first couple of years, but you know, through the whole life of the company, uh, you know, it needs to be, uh, you know, there's only so many times you can take a shot like that, right? And so, so the result to the impact on fund returns needs to be of a scale uh, that, you know, that it merits that given, you know, the power law distributions and the statistics about, you know, how often... Uh, a, a particular uh, investment is going to work. And so, um, you know, so it's still, it still argues for, you know, pretty, maybe not 20%, but, you know, pretty substantial ownership. If, if uh, you know, you're expecting really significant time intensive contributions from that investor. And I think, I think one of the reasons why, you know, some other, you know, you know maybe the founder that you quoted, um, you know, was able to sort of do business that way is there's been so many new entrants uh, that have, Pounded into pounded into venture that you know maybe aren't devo- you know devoting that kind of company building craftsmanship to their projects and they're and they're really you know they're pursuing a a, a spray and pray strategy or a capital deployment strategy and you know they think the name of the game is access and and having you know a hundred portfolio companies is no big deal because they're not really spending any time <laughs> with any of them and and so that that's the type of investor that you'll get. Uh, in it with that type of a model. Peter, Aaron Berg said on the show the other day, listen, with the massive increase in capital supply that we see into venture, you will fundamentally just have worse returns. Um, I think to your point there, you know, the movement away from 20 to probably closer to 12 to 13, you compound that with dilution and fund sizes increasing. I'm not optimistic about the future of venture returns. Uh, I'm with Roger in that one. Are we being too ne- negative and do you disagree um it's a cyclical business uh and so i think there are moments in the cycle when returns suffer and the factors that you described are, are are part of the reason that there there are other reasons but every time somebody pronounces the death of you know a venture you know then something changes and you know it's, oh, it's, not, it's not it's not it's not the death of venture it's the transition of venture away from a boutique asset class to a commoditized industry like private equity where you have much lower returns across the board in the same fashion yeah not no and, and we've heard this before we've i mean this 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 type of uh, statement has been made at multiple times even just during you know the the time that I've been in the business and it's, it's been wrong every time. Um, what, what was some other time? I'm just intrigued. I want to learn from you. What were some other times when they said that and why were they unjust then? I'm just trying to learn so we don't make the same mistakes. Yeah. Post 2000. Um, so post 2000 that, you know, this, it, the, you know, we, we went through a, a large um, reset and there was a lot of people doing math saying like, Oh, you know, for, you know, all this capital has been raised and, you know, to earn a decent, you know, venture style return on this capital, then, you know, the, this amount of, uh, you know, value needs to be created, which means this many IPOs of this size. And that's just not possible. Right. So we're, so we're, you know, so buckle up for permanently reduced returns. And those guys were so wrong because it ended up actually that the outcome sizes did increase. The number of them did increase. And like, what's going on is you just have technology becoming a more and more uh, important um, component in the global economy, right? It, you know, the, you can look at this just by measuring tech sector, narrowly defined tech sector as a percentage of global GDP. And that doesn't even count, you know, the sort of the technology enabled componentry that's in other sectors, you know, like financial services or whatever. And so I think just the relative importance of, of technology and its benefit um, in everything we do, uh, it has increased so rapidly uh, that it's, it's kind of kept pace uh, with 
you know, the sort of the, the depressing factors. Now, it's cyclical, right? So there are times when you're overshooting and then there are times when you're undershooting. But, you know, I'm, I'm you know, sort of normalizing for the cyclicality. Uh, I'm, I'm over the somewhat longer term. I, I remain quite optimistic. You mentioned the cyclicality there. I think people forget the cyclicality of liquidity and venture sucks when you look historically unless you take advantage of very small windows of liquidity where you can generate outstanding returns truly outstanding returns that beat all other asset classes i'm intrigued from your lessons and experience on liquidity what are your biggest lessons on liquidity management and getting out at the right time um i'm pretty bad at this harry uh, so, <laughs> so am I. So it's okay. <laughs> there's, there's, there's others that are way better. And this is true, personal, you know, personally. Like I, I tend to hold the public stocks of portfolio companies that have on, you know, done IPOs, and I just have ridden many of them straight into the ground. You know, sometimes it works out well. You know, though, and I think that more than makes up for it. I, st- I still hold a lot of our Facebook um, investment. You know, back from, um, uh, you know, the Excel days. Uh, I've never sold a share of Snowflake, and you know I'm optimistic that that'll turn out to be a good decision. So you know, but there's there's counterexamples too. Um, you know, you don't control the environment. You know, you you have to just sort of recognize it and 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 act appropriately. Um, I try and really listen closely to the management teams. You know, because because they are so much closer to the action. And you know, if you're talking about should you sell a private company or not, their recommendations need to be really. Uh, discerned and 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 closely understood and and I you know so I and I've made the mistake of of kind of not doing that um, you know well enough in in the past uh, I mean there's an example in my mind right now where there was a team that was recommending a sale it was a little surprising you know that they were doing it you know they, they even had a buyer on the line and the board didn't even know this was going on so we're like what are you guys doing you know this business is going great and you know. And uh, and they weren't very articulate. I think they were a little embarrassed, uh, you know, that they'd been running this kind of rogue Cortev operation. And so, so we didn't we didn't sell the company. And it ended up, I mean, it was only like six months later that I fully understood the situation. And it's like, oh, they were right, you know. We and if only I had been a little, uh, you know, sort of more sensitive, sensitive an instrument <laughs> in trying to understand where they were coming from. You know, you want a pressure test, but but at the end of the day, you got to pay close attention to what's coming out. The show's got more and more successful because I ask questions that I'm just too interested by. I asked Roger Ehrenberg when he mentioned some of his successes, but a question that I think to a lot, which is, you know, you mentioned holding Facebook stock that, you know, Excel was a phenomenally successful period for you in terms of you know, wealth generation. Do richer investors make better investors because they are not so scared? Yeah, I don't know. And I mean, and you could ask the same question about founders, um, you know, the, which this is like the argument for secondary sales. And, you know, it's a very closely related point. I kind of think no. Uh, <laughs> I think, you know, I, let, I think hunger, hunger is important for everybody. Uh, some people stay hungry even if they have substantial personal balance sheets, you know, and they have, they have these other things motivating them besides just finances. Other things they're trying to achieve or just their, their personalities are wired a certain way. Um, but, uh, yeah, no, I don't, I, you know, I, 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 I guess I kind of go the other way on that one. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, Peter, I want to move into a quick fire. So I say a short statement. You give me your immediate thoughts. Does that sound okay? Sure. Okay, so let's start with what have you changed your mind on most in the last 12 months? Uh, the, imp- <laughs> the importance of marketing and venture capital. <laughs> uh, huh. you know, well, how, how so? Well, the industry has scaled to the point where, um, you know, just things like word of mouth and, and direct personal touch, uh, you know, are insufficient <laughs> to reach the market. And even though I happen to prefer working that way. <laughs> Uh, but I just have to get over myself a little stuff, man. Tell me, what's the biggest or best investment advice you've received that sticks with you most? Jim Swartz and Arthur Patterson, you know, told me, like, look, pick an area that you think is interesting and make yourself the world's, like, leading authority within it. And don't worry about what's going on elsewhere and, and chase after other stuff. Good things will happen elsewhere. But if you've sort of, you know, if you do this, it'll, it'll, it'll work out. <sighs> Bold. It's bold, I think right? If you, yeah, you know, and so that, that's why I'm, I'm always talking about focus. And you know, they they used a term called the prepared mind, which was how they were describing being the world's leading authority. You know, in in your area, and 
it's what you know it's, it's, it's worked hard, for though, us because you you have to be it's a trade of many great ambassadors but you have to be willing to be lonely for long long periods of time you know you could be a young person there in a large firm and say i'm going to focus on web3 and you know web3 is in its winter period now and may come back may not come back i'm not making assertions but if you had focus and others around you had done enterprise or ai you are in you know the bottom half of the firm it's tough it's a risky strategy i mean part of that is you also have to be willing to call a spade a spade and sometimes you may have been you know mining a particular vein for years and you just have to say you know what <laughs> Like no mas, <laughs> this this isn't panning out. Like I, I devoted a substantial amount of my time to clean tech at one point. Uh, you know, just because, and this was in like two thousand six, two thousand seven, two thousand eight, and it was because you know no one else at the firm was spending any time on it. You know, I sort of felt like it was an exposure point, uh, and I was like, okay, look, I'll I'll do some, I'll do this at least with a fraction of my time for a while, and. Ended up, I, you know, I think that, you know, my biggest contribution was keeping us out of those deals. <laughs> is, uh... <laughs> oh, that's brilliant. Um, tell me, what's the biggest mistake you see young and emerging VCs make? I think over-reliance on quantitative metrics in investment decision-making. Um, so the whole, and in, in early stage. Uh, so the, I think the dependence upon this sort of suite of metrics as indicators of, of, what, you know, uh, whether you should invest or not, you know, is it, it has its place, but like if it's over applied early on, you're, mi you're missing a lot. Right. Okay. So it's a crutch because they lack the courage of their convictions. Me asking you, how do you create an environment where young people don't lack the courage of conviction? Yeah. Um, well, I mean, it gets back to that enough rope to hang yourself, but also some guardrails to, you know, keep you from <laughs> losing confidence. Uh, and so, you know, pushing pushing that accountability, but also that group support, you know, sort of in tandem is part of it. You know, I mean, when you're doing, you know, like the metrics are great, but I mean, you know, you need strategic analysis, you need judgment, you know, you need, you know, a lot of other things that won't show up on the spreadsheet. And, you know, you got to develop those skills too, if you want to be a good investor. And so- you know, kind of making, yeah, make, making, making sure that that is part of part of the program uh, is is important. Hit me, my friend. What's the piece of advice you hear most often given that you think is BS? Uh, that venture is a scale gain. Like I, I think it actually kind of runs quite the opposite. That excessive scale, you know, gets in the way of excellence. So you know, you can be you can be too small too. You know, don't get me wrong. And scale scale has its benefits, but I think. It's a self-serving argument, you know, that sort of scale trumps all. I, I just don't buy it. Was it tough doing Wing? Because like at Excel, you have a fundraising machine. I mean, at best, you rock up and say hi and thank you. Uh, and then with Wing, it's like you, you actually have to fundraise because it's your fund and you're founding a firm. Was that tough just to make the transition? There's a lot of demand for unadulterated early stage venture capital, you know, being practiced by experienced people with a track record. Um, and a lot of the very best people with those track records, you know, are, are within aircraft carriers now and the LPs are somewhat frustrated by, you know, okay, maybe I, I get to put a dollar in the early stage strategy and I got nine other dollars, you know, going across all these other strategies. And so, so when you show up with a pure play early stage strategy with, you know, people that know what they're doing, like there's, there's a fair amount of investor interest in that. And that was certainly our experience in, in raising wing one and, and all the, all the subsequent wing funds. So I, I think we've had a very, a very positive experience and, and we're very fortunate um, in, in that regard, but it is, I think it has to do with the, the nature of the product, if you will, and, and product market fit. No, I, I totally get you there. What's the biggest mistake you see first time founders make? I think choosing expedience over, you know, the hard things that, that actually contribute to long-term value. You know, there, there's sort of quick fixes and, and sort of feel good measures that can take the edge off whatever uh, is bothering you uh, at a moment in time. But those chickens come home to roost. Uh, so that this might manifest itself in, you know, in a hiring decision, you know, where you opt for good enough instead of holding out for great. Uh, this might manifest itself in fundraising where you sort of take, you know, ready, friendly capital instead of partners that, you know, can really help you. Uh, and, you know, eventually th those accumulation of, of expediences um, compromise a company. That's a great one. Um, 
I'm a big fan of that one, Peter. Well done. Um, f- f- penultimate one. Uh, zero interest run- rate environment brought some poor investor behavior. What do you think was the biggest sin of the zero interest rate environment period? I think um, large amounts of capital finding its way into the hands of uh, of, of the wrong hands um, uh, in, in terms of the people that would be managing it and investing it. And so I think what, you had sorry, what, what what is not not I'm not asking you to name names don't worry but like what is the wrong hands like people who are inexperienced ill equipped not knowledgeable what what denotes wrong hands I think all the above you know I mean I just sort of don't understand you know what it what it means to you know build build a company and be a steward of other people's capital I mean I'll give you a name soft you know like SoftBank you know like. Why did that ever make any sense? And and who was that? <laughs> you know, who, who was that good for? Uh, you know, I, I didn't, you know, I think it, there was a fair amount of damage being done. Um, you know, by large amounts of capital being thrown around indiscriminately. You know, sort of damaging the very properties it was investing in uh, and um, distorting industry behavior. And again, not, and not just from that one entity, but you know, others. Others that we that we can mention. So I think I think the distortions. Do you know why that they're doing it today? You know, some of the rounds I see happening for hot AI companies are ludicrous, and they're from the same players that bluntly made the same mistakes last time. And I'm worried it's happening again from these large aircraft carriers. Well, it's the AUM model, right? I mean, so if you're managing large amounts of money, you have to, you have to deploy it. <clears throat> Uh, and if everyone's doing it, you won't be punished. Uh, you, you won't be punished for a mistake that everyone is making. Um, so is, is I think <laughs> part of part of part of what drives industry big. But that's an interesting thing, though. Going back to the question on rich investors being better, when you're rich, one would think, and I would think, not necessarily having as much as others. Like, I wouldn't be so worried about being punished. Fuck it. If I've made a hundred million, what you're going to punish me for missing a super cycle? Fine. I thought it was the right thing to do at the time. Yeah, I think it's more institutional behavior than individual behavior. You know, so even, even you know, if you have a, a large, you know, a large firm, you know, there's lots of people there. Institutional self-preservation is sort of the name of the game. And, you know, so you've got, um, I think, a, a goal of, and no one will stay, state this, right? But, you know, but the a lot of what's going on is to you want to deliver good enough returns to, you know, raise that next fund, you know, at whatever you know, scale, uh, you, you know, you can raise it at. And at some point, um, you know, your your investors are so committed to the vehicle uh, that, you know, they they become like your allies too, because the last thing they want to do is <laughs> say, hey, this thing that I committed to is, you know, makes no sense. I mean, that's a brave LP, uh, you know, that would, um, you know, having, you know, sort of vouched for something for multiple funds and committed, you know, very large amounts of money to then say at some point, you know, this decision I made, you know, it was actually a bad decision, you know, that that that's unusual behavior too. So so these things become self-perpetuating. Yeah, no, I totally get you. Uh, final one for you, Peter. Ten years time wing, it'll be 2034. If everything goes to plan, we often ask companies this, as you know, what does this company become? If I apply that to wing, if everything goes to plan, what does wing become? Yeah. Um, well, I mean, this is the original mission statement, right? Is, is to be, you know, the the very best partner to founders building um, companies that matter in B two B technology. You know, from their early stages all the way through to, um, you know, hopefully a, a self sustaining um, company of enduring value. Um, Ten years from now, I won't be leading that charge, uh, and you know, the the generation of investors that we've been developing here uh, at Wang will, you know, hopefully have. Uh, sort of taken it to new heights, well beyond, <laughs> well beyond what my limited capabilities <laughs> to deliver. Uh, and uh, yeah, I look forward. I look forward to to cheering for that. Peter, listen, this has been such a joy. Thank you so much for joining me, and thank you for putting with my wayward questions and schedule. Oh, thanks, Harry. Uh, it's been a blast. Really enjoyed it.